issues that are affecting the rest of the world in terms of what I think is the tragic suffering. As Susan Sontag said, modern existence has become watching calamities on your television set and turning them away, or turning them off when you don't like what you see. But never forget that there is evil in this world and that we can do something about it. I believe and I would hope that as you proceed next Tuesday and you make your own choice on your own election, that one of the ideas that might be there in terms of starting the conversation with a new president of the United States is to say, how do we put some of these ideas to work? How do we provide the security and protection of people as a foremost priority? How do we work and collaborate to do it internationally? How do we work to do it together in our own North American sort of neighborhood? That, I think, could be a conversation well worth having. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we will continue with the conversation in just a minute, but first we would like to invite Ambassador Manat and Mrs. Manat up to make an awards presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, it's our pleasure to, uh, again this year, have the chance to have a wonderful, wonderful lecture as done by doc Dr. Axworthy tonight. It's our uh, a hope to have the discussion in the political economy and the industrial society. I don't know exactly what that means, but our daughter majored in college, and so that's what we're always trying to highlight. And in the years such as this year, we're told we're not supposed to be political. Now, for me, it's very hard, certainly on a year in which I'm feeling the way I am about an election next Tuesday. It's very hard for me not to be political. When I was a student, like many of you are here tonight, I was very uh, political, and it caught me in the intervening 40 or 50 years. Uh, I'm still fairly political. But tonight, as four years ago, we wanted a distinguished international visitor to, to set the framework for a visit, for a conversation, for a dialogue that we uh, need to continue to have. The last two uh, foreign ministers, of course, have been from, from Mexico and from Sweden. Very, very important visits. We had a visit last year from Fred Smith of Federal Express, and we've had Senator Hagel and Senator Biden in the intervening years when we can have uh, domestic political officials. So, in honor of uh, this wonderful uh, discussion, Kathy and I would like to present this uh, small plaque in appreciation for what Dr. Axworthy has done tonight in establishing the tone and direction of the conversation, which I'm sure many of you will like to follow up with some questions tonight. Dr. Axworthy, it's our great pleasure to present this to you. And you have a, a cameraman who's about ready to take our picture, so you see how this works? Okay. I'm not used to photo ops. I know, I know. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, question time. Let's begin the conversation. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, I'm just wondering if, if maybe it's better if you if you use the mic so other people could hear could hear it. I think there's a mic that they can probably carry around or something. One of the um, proposals that I think that the U.S. Congress is talking about, and I know this is not a big enough issue like world issues, but it's still very, what you're talking about with human security, is that um, they want to take American citizenship away from children born to U.S. Yeah. immigrants that are illegal. I just was wondering, what was your take on that? Well, uh, I actually got very involved with it. I, uh, as uh, uh, was pointed out by by Jim, uh, I've been sitting on the High Commission for Legal Empowerment uh, set up by the United Nations to look at what's the connection by establishing legal rights in poverty. There's a clear correlation that if you deny rights, and the first and most important is legal identity. Um, that if you don't have a paper 
that says you belong somewhere, that you've got a right to an education or to health care or to employment, uh, then you become zero. And I remember when I was in Peru overseeing the elections there for the Organization of American States, President uh, Toledo said to me, you know, there's a million Peruvians who don't exist. I said, what do you mean, don't exist? And he said, well, we simply have not, the, the Indians in the highland have not been registered as citizens. They're there, we know they're, but we haven't got the means or the ability or the will to do it. And so I started getting interested when I went on this commission, and I headed up the committee with uh, Justice Kennedy from the uh, U.S. Supreme Court. We were uh, sort of co-chairing this committee on legal empowerment, and to realize this is true not just in undeveloped countries, it's true in developed countries as well. There are all kinds of people who have varying degrees of lack of legal rights and their protection or access to the justice system. And that, let me make a point that at a time when we're, funds are very short and the economic system is really shrinking, the lack of legal entitlement and empowerment uh, is one of the contributing causes to poverty. And if you reverse that, you can begin to provide a major stimulus property rights for women, ability to use a bank, children who are denied their rights and therefore can't go to school, uh, people who feel that the justice system, and so they work in an underground economy, hiding away from and afraid of the, of the formal legal system, and therefore what happens is first you deny yourself of the economic benefit of that because they're not paying taxes and they're not being involved, not making contributions. You've got a high bill for sort of uh, criminal sort of prosecutions and apprehension. And thirdly, you have just the social sort of erosion of not being a person, of not being identified. And if I could be allowed, just, uh, could I just give you one example? Back in my younger salad days when I was Minister of Immigration for Canada, one of my jobs was to deal with, we have large numbers of uh, farm workers and nannies coming into Canada, very similar to what you have, not at the same scope, but we have tens of thousands who come in to do our crops for us and to look after our children. And uh, when I first became a minister, I realized I had a police force. I had all these kind of junior G-men running around, kind of chasing people. And I said, what are we doing that for? You know, well, that's, you know, these are illegal immigrants. These are mainly people who come here to work, and they kind of get used to the country, and then they go into hiding. And you know the story. So I said, so why don't we want them? So to make the story short, I simply passed a rule, a law, a ministerial rule, didn't even put in legislation, called the nanny law, where he said, if you come in to work in this country and we, we give you the right to look after our children, nothing more precious than that, or to gather our food, and you're here for three years and you're a good citizen and you don't get into uh, trouble with the cops, then you have a right to apply to be a citizen automatically. And I've got to tell you, over the years, it has done more in terms of creating a diversity of population that feels settled, loyal, committed, and have become the Philip Let me use the Philippine community for one example. In my own city, they are one of the strongest cultural communities. I watch in my own university now their children excelling in the sciences, becoming doctors, becoming opera singers. I mean, it's extraordinary to just to see how that talent pool rather than being in the shadows, has been brought into the, in the mainstream. And I think that that, to me, is the fundamentals that we can provide a human right in, is the fundamental of legal identity. By the way, I should say, I spent 27 years in Parliament, and we do a question period every day. You should put this in your Congress. It's kind of fun. You have to get up and take heat, but you can only you ask one question that's supplementary. <laughs> But I learned never to really answer the question that I was given. I just so you have to realize I'm kind of slippery that way. <laughs> I want to go back to your comment about there is evil in the world and we can do something about it. I guess I'm keenly aware that to a lot of other people in the world, when they look for evil, I'm afraid they find us. And I guess I ask, what do you think is the source of this evil? Is, is that human nature? Do we get to that kind of philosophical discussion? Is it just simply that we have, they have not? It's envy, it's greed. If somehow we can all yeah. boats, you know, rise. Yeah, I, you know something? I, I, I wish I could answer that. I, I've certainly asked myself about that a lot of times. I just know I've seen it. I remember sitting in a basement bunker with Fodi Sanko, 
who was head of the RUP in Sierra Leone. I was there to try and negotiate the release of child soldiers. And here was this guy sitting there knowing full well that uh, he was keeping 7,000 young girls who had been taken from schools and convents in Sierra Leone. And he was lying through his teeth. And I just said, if I ever met an evil guy? I mean, I spent uh, two hours in Milosevic. Now, he could justify it. There's, you know, there's history. There. Anyone can find a reason. It's greed. It's national interest. It's uh, whatever. But there's some people who just really find that the that those best elements. And yet, uh, you know, when you when you look at the modern or the contemporary research results coming out of the neurosciences, which I think is, as you as you know, changing so many ways we think about human behavior, that they've now discovered in the frontal lobes up around in here somewhere, that there are certain kind of brain actions that are inherently universal towards making people want to do good, but there's also back in here the emotionally irrational ones that we inherit from our sort of uh, Neanderthal grandfather, you know, great-great-grandfathers that want us to say, no, we're not going to listen to these frontal lobes, we're going to react to these back lobes. This is a fairly simplistic way of doing neuroscience, believe me. But, but there is those kind of discoveries coming out, and we haven't been able to apply it yet. But if I could just make one historical comment. I, can, I grew up in a period, I mean, I... You know, I was born in the Second World War and grew up, spent my, uh, some, a lot of my schooling years here in the United States during the 60s. And I guess if we come out of the 60s, we have a certain thought about life. I have an enormous admiration for the renewal capacity of the United States. I've never seen a country that can grab itself and refresh itself, even though it gets itself into a trough, maybe gets into some darkness, but they just have a, a way of trying to re restart and restore. Uh, that's something I think that's admired around the world. We're waiting for it to happen. Could you say a few words about the stability of governments in the face of economic collapse? Yeah. yeah uh, uh, Hitler, 1933. Yeah, I, I was going to say I could maybe start uh, Wall Street, 2008, uh, <laughs> because I think what happened there is that. Uh, what, we're, what has not been discussed on, I mean, I think we're all aware of the collapse that's going on and the way in which governments are m amassing trillions of dollars to try to keep the system sort of float until it kind of resurrects itself. But we know that there are some direct causes. I mean, the, I mean Alan Greenspan admitted himself what a week ago, boy, did I make a mistake. I thought bankers would be good self-regulators. Well, then they weren't, and we're paying a price for it. But you know, sir, here's, an, here's a something to really think about. That I, uh, I was talking uh, just last night over dinner with a group of people who are in the investment business because university presidents have to do that from time to time. Here's what they translate to say, you know, that if you begin to look at the way in which the turmoil is re-channeling a lot of financial flows, that one of the things that's happening is the sovereign wealth funds that are coming out of Middle East oil places, China, Malaysia, other places. Sovereign wealth funds are basically government protected funds. You know what they are. And they're buying in to your economic institutions. So if a sovereign wealth fund from Dubai owns 20% of Citibank, how much freedom are you going to have to change a Middle East policy? Right? And that's happening in so many other places. And the whole use of sovereign wealth funds has a political implication that I don't think that we're really talking about. Yet. And that's not that, but the whole shifting arrangements, we're going to have to do a lot of restructuring. It's going to have to happen internationally. We have to kind of do it together, but it's got to be built in because I don't think that self-regulation at a national level works anymore. I mean, you all read the story of that French you know, middle-level investment banker in Paris who at one point was moving 50 and 60 billion euros around and nobody wanted to catch them. The company didn't because they were making money, but there's nobody else there, because he was, but he was using the, the German exchange. So we can't do this for ourselves. I mean, if there's ever one example, you can talk about tsunamis in Southeast Asia, you can talk about infectious diseases coming out you know, that spreads around the world. We better start talking about the way in which the economic system is now infecting the political and governmental system. And I, I don't see anybody out there talking about how we're gonna sort of uh, restructure that. And that boy is powerful. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> not to get back to uh, immediate politics too much, 
But in the recent federal election, uh, the Tories were returned to a minority government under Stephen Harper. You know how to hurt a guy, don't you? So uh, <laughs> sorry, sir. <laughs> uh, and yes, uh, the uh, the Liberals and the Bloc were yeah. uh, defeated under Stéphane Dion and uh, and right. uh, Gilles Dusset. Um Given this, what advice would you provide to an Obama administration regarding relations with the conservative government under Prime Minister Harper? <laughs> well, I just did a piece in the Ottawa Citizen op-ed saying that it's time that progressive forces in Canada got together. First, uh, I think we're we're fractured right now, and we're not, and so we're going to perpetuate sort of this kind of minority status. Uh, I would hope that uh, I, I'm going to be very candid. I think Mr. Harper's in danger of isolating our country. Uh, you know, his friends in Australia is gone. Mr. Bush is going. He's got nobody else to talk to. And I think Mr. Obama better reach out. And I, I'll tell you where I would start. I think you better come to the Canadian and say it's time we started really talking about how we rethink NAFTA, not so much in terms of you know, protectionism per se, but how we deal with the kind of issues I talked about. Because I think if, you, if we get that kind of dialogue and the, the sort of, I think, uh, insight that's being shown, then I think you can get a conversation. But here is something that's equally important. What's happening in between our two countries right now is that increasingly Ottawa and Washington aren't mattering that much. What's really taking place is between premiers and governors. That if you look at what's happening in the Midwest on the energy issue, on the agriculture, it's beginning to happen at a regional level of working out their compacts so that we have an alliance with California on, on emissions. And now there are, what, seven states and three Canadian provinces who've come together on a common agreement to do something about emission standards. So the, the, that kind of uh, sub-national level cross-border issues, I think, are part. I think it, it happens in the private sector. It should be happening in the university level that those conversations start placing. But what could happen, I mean, I think where an Obama, if I can use him as an example with the eloquence he has, and stimulating people to say, get involved, don't be passive, help govern, is not just to say, show up to vote on, you know, on election day and then go back and do, to say, you start talking about these things with your cross-border neighbors. You start talking to people. Get the Canadians kind of engaged on what do we do about the Columbia River Treaty or the Red River or what we do about nutrients in our soil. There's a, an agenda a thousand miles long. And I think if he kick-started that, not only would you might get a better reaction because I think Mr. Harper is in a bind. He doesn't have a majority. And if the opposition say that Americans are going to talk, then they put the heat on. But on the other time, you've got all kinds of other jurisdictions and sectors and institutions who, with that kind of stimulus, could start putting it together again. That would be my advice. That's part of the conversation. Hi there. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, as an undergraduate student, I'm a little bit nervous. So I'm going to read my question <laughs> to you. Sure. Um, as an adherent to the Geneva Convention and Charter of the League of Nations, the North-South developed developing divide is of tremendous importance to me. Thank you for your tremendous efforts and accomplishments. Unfortunately, it seems that there are many who adhere to their own dogmatic egotism and partisan behavior, speaking of leaders. How might we go about encouraging dialogue from and with these individuals who may be more resistant to these efforts, both domestically and as a member of the global community? <coughs> There's lots of ways. I, 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 look, I, I don't want to pretend that I've got magic answers, but I, my experience is that that dialogue or conversation you talked about can't be sort of a little minuet that takes place at a summit meeting in a castle somewhere in Scotland between G8 leaders who have already been programmed and their Sherpas have already worked out to communicate. Bastard, you know how this works. You know, that, that is bullshit, to be honest with you. I mean, I, I've gone through that kind of, of phony stuff and it's, it's nonsense. But where you can do it, and I, I use an example of the International Court and the Protocol on Child Soldiers and the Landmine Street. We, sent, we had the biggest Amway sales team in the world. I got every member of parliament, every senator, every ex service center, private people, university presidents, going around the world knocking on every door of their counterparts and their peers saying, look, you, put the, you mobilize in your own country. We gave money to NGOs in Mozambique, in Angola, in Cambodia, say, you put the here. We mobilized a very large scale sort of public participation. And, what's, and that was 10 years ago. Think of what you can do now with the internet. 
you know, you've got organizations like uh, Take It Global, which each year is adding 100,000 young men and women to their site in terms of mobilizing action around a series of global issues. You've got the new, rea you know, the second reality group, uh, Global Kids working out of New York, which have created a whole new virtual world. You've got, you know, the, the magic of this new instrument has just been barely touched in terms of that connection that's going on. I mean, I wish I was, you know, if you say you're an undergraduate, I wish I was an undergraduate again. Uh, well, I couldn't afford the tuition anymore, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but you know something? You're in a world now where we have actually now create a capacity, and this sounds cliche, of really connecting as global citizens. You take your cell phone, I don't have mine with me. I actually use a Blackberry because it's Canadian made. Uh, <laughs> but you take that and there is now an encryption system been developed in Austria that you could have worldwide voting, you know, controlled voting. That you would pick it up, your cell phone, and you put in your encryption number and you, you get the thing and you can, uh, you can make decisions. Now, what does that do to representative democracy? I don't know. Got some good political scientists. Start thinking about it. But you have that capacity now to mobilize and connect and link and create the kind, new kinds of networks whether it's on nuclear disarmament or on global change or you know, child soldiers or poverty, boy, the power that you, you young men and women have in these universities and in the high schools, take it, is, uh, is being used a lot and I think the conversations are going on, but it needs to get sort of, it, it has to ratchet up to a next stage where it really begins to uh, cut into the political mainstream because you're still going to have governments, you're still going to have elected representatives, you need them. That's one way of holding things accountable. And so you have to make that gap. And that's one thing I've been watching with great interest, the campaigns here, the immense use of that to mobilize votes and money. Now the question is, can we actually mobilize it around issues and ideas and policies? That could also be one of the inheritances or conversations if Mr. Obama becomes president. Dr. Eckworthy, we very much appreciate the fact that you came and uh, delivered a very well thought out presentation. Uh, we'd like you to know also that uh, we think Canada is pretty good at restoring themselves from time yeah, to time great. after <laughs> tough times as well. Yeah. Uh, you, you brought NAFTA up late in your conversation, which I was glad to hear you say, and you indicate that Mr. Obama, Senator Obama would like to do some fixes. I think it's fair to say that Senator McCain would also like I to think do so some too. fixes. Right. Good. Uh, Good. My question is, do you support NAFTA and what it's done, or, or is your position just that it, uh, it has to be fixed? No, I, I think it, there are parts of it that I think uh, work okay. You know, I think bringing down tariff barriers is important, because there is a tremendous free. I mean, the example here is I just gave you that, uh, you know, if I go to my notes for a moment, 80,000 jobs in Iowa are created through Canada, Canadian U.S. trade. That's a lot of employment. And it's, it's two ways. I mean, uh, my own province benefits the same way from, from uh, exports coming out of uh, Iowa into our region. We're the two largest traders with each other. That's good. Uh, but there are parts of it that aren't so good. Chapter 11, let me give you a very specific example. I don't think it's affected you. But Chapter 11 of, of NAFTA says that, is written in clearly, that you can take a lawsuit against any government action that you think is inimical to your economic interest. Well, I was in cabinet when we were trying to change the mix in gasoline fuels to re reduce the toxicity and lead content in gasoline fuels. We were taken to court by a company who makes that in California. And we had all our best lawyers figuring out how we could get that. We couldn't. We had to cave in. And there's all kinds of cases now being taken. Uh, let's use the water example. There, are, you know, there is a, a component of NAFTA that says uh, you, you can't have bulk water shipments, but you can sell it in bottles. Duh. You know, figure that one out. But if we get down to what I think is going to be probably the toughest issue between our two countries in the next five, seven, eight, ten years is going to be the issue of fresh water. You can't have a clause like that where it simply becomes juridical and jurisprudence. I'm sorry, but it's got to be worked out politically. It's got to be negotiated. It's got to be agreed to. And as long as chapter 11 there, I mean, we will, we will set up a, a hornet's nest of law cases challenging this issue. So let's, let's work that on. And I think even more importantly, the most crucial issue probably between us two is, is the use of energy. And how do you begin to, we have the tar sands. 
which is the largest reserve. We now, we now sell 80% of our natural gas, mainly to the Midwestern in, in the United States. We fuel most of your activities in that area. No argument. We, we get paid for it. So I'm not, our hydroelectric power, we get paid for it. But the question is, event, you know, those extractions are beginning to severely hurt our environment. So what we have to work out with the United States is say, are you prepared to take, are you prepared to share the emission credit issue so that we can begin to sort of, if we're going to be digging holes to give you tar sands, we want something in, return, in terms of how do we get the credit for it so we both share the responsibility of making sure it is. And in the meantime, start really investing in the renewables. I mean, uh, your economy is somewhat similar to what we have in Manitoba. Uh, the future is a green economy, that you take your agricultural base, the kind of things that you're growing, these are all natural products. How do you convert them into energy purposes? How do you convert them into new foods and soils? The technology goes with it. Boy, I mean, that, that's the economic bonanza for the next several decades. But you know, we should be doing it together. Uh, I, don't think it, I don't think it's a case of beggar than thy neighbor in this kind of case. And that's where I think we could take the framework of NAFTA, but I talk about doing a new agreement on water, energy, and environment so that we actually integrate those things together so they're not seen as separate uh, silos. That's where I think that discussion should take place. Ladies and gentlemen, let's please give uh, Dr. Dr. Axworthy a nice <laughs> Iowa thanks. Uh, Dr. Axworthy will be joining us in reception, and there are several of you who wanted to ask him questions. Please do. Thank you very much for joining us.